Love Minutes Church. How are you guys feeling? Woo, come on, if you're able, let's go ahead and stand to our feet and let's lift our praise to the Lord because he is worthy of it all, amen? Come on, sing us out. I praise in the valley. I praise in the valley. I praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm short.
if you're dealing with spiritual attacks, if you're dealing with the enemy here in flesh and blood, know that he has already won. He is the victor forever and ever. Amen. you guys, but I love it when we can all come together and we can worship and make a big deal about the Jesus that we get to serve. My name is Jamie, and I am so happy to see everyone in the room with me, but also everyone at all of our micro sites, all of our sites in the Fayetteville, Fort Liberty area. If you are in Hawaii, if you are in Oh my gosh, we've got places everywhere. If you're in Colorado, if you are in Timbuktu and you found us on YouTube, we are so happy and excited to have you with us. And if this is your first time, welcome. We are glad that you chose to spend your day with us. You could be anywhere doing anything, but you decided to be here with us. And if it is your first time, I've got two things I'm gonna ask you to do for us. Number one, please pull this card that says guest out of the seat back pocket in front of you or text the word guest to the number that you see on the screen. That's going to give us just a little bit of information. It's going to let us know who joined us today. It's also going to help us know how we might be able to serve you better. If you have prayer requests, if you're looking for information, we'll be able to connect with you and do all of that. The second thing I'm gonna ask you to do is for those of you in the room with me, once the offering buckets go by, drop that completed guest card into the bucket 
And then after service, step out to our Connection Center. Let them know that it was your first time here because we have a gift that we wanna put into your hands. It's a simple way for us to say thank you for being here. And we hope that you make Mana Church your new church home. Now, Mana family, let's do what we do best and let us welcome all of our first time guests tonight. If you've been here for any length of time, you've heard a couple of things said repeatedly and it's because they're important. The first thing you've heard is we were created on purpose for a purpose. And you've also heard that we're not just a church with small groups, we are a small groups church. Small groups are where we get to build these lifelong connections with people. They are our band of brothers, our circle of sisters, our village, our tribe, whatever you wanna call them. These are the people that stand with you in the darkest, toughest times. They're the friends that you need to have before you know that you need those friends. And so if you haven't engaged in small groups yet, I encourage you, take those steps. And if you're looking for an easy first step for small groups, the growth track is the way that you wanna do that. They are a series of small groups that we have designed that help you understand what we mean when we say you were created on purpose for a purpose. They help you understand what that purpose is, how you fit into the larger context of being a Christ follower and what that looks like in Mana Church and in the world at large. So if you have not done small groups yet, if you need more information or you're looking to go ahead and take that step and get signed up, then you can step out to the Connection Center, talk to someone in a here to serve lanyard or shirt, they can get you signed up, but you can also go to our website, mana.church, order our app and you can start the process there. I'm gonna invite our host team forward so that way we can go ahead and continue worshiping through tithes and offerings. If you would like to give, pay like easy way, text give to the number you see on the screen or go to the app, the website, you can give that way. If you have a physical contribution, please drop it in the bucket as it comes by. And again, if you're filling out a guest card, please put it in that bucket. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we just thank you that we get to continue serving you, Lord, and honoring you through our tithes and our offerings. Father, we pray that you would multiply these gifts that we bring to you and that you would make it hard to go to hell throughout the world because of what we're doing tonight. In your precious name we pray, amen. Now, that's all I have for us. I'm gonna ask you to turn your eyes to the screens for some video announcements. At Mana Church, we do three things. We love God, we love each other, and we love the world. And one of the ways we love the world is through world-changing local outreach. Monday through Friday at the Fayetteville Cares Day Resource Center downtown, we get to serve those in need across our city by giving out hundreds of free lunches, providing shower, clothing, and laundry services, and serving as a hub for other providers. This program is a testament to our commitment that no one should go hungry, and therefore, we offer these meals free of charge to anyone who arrives hungry. This is a wonderful opportunity we have to grab our red shirt and serve our community. Check out the web or app to sign up today. And if you or someone you know is in need of a meal, be sure to direct them to the Fayetteville Cares Day Resource Center. Join us in our mission to ensure that no one goes hungry in our city. Hey y'all, it's Natty, and I wanted to share an exciting update from one of our ministry partners in Ireland. Ireland for Jesus is dedicated to advancing church planning across Emerald Isle and a vision to see every region of Ireland transformed by the gospel. In a land once thriving with churches and missionaries, unfortunately, Ireland has seen a significant spiritual decline in recent years, specifically in the Republic of Ireland. Our ministry partner, Pastor Gary Bolton, is working along with other leaders in responding to God's call to restore Ireland to its former spiritual vibrancy. Their mission is to see new churches established throughout the entire island, bringing spiritual renewal and growth to communities in need. Like Mana Church, Ireland for Jesus is committed to church planting and Kingdom Multiply. Join us in prayer as we aim to bring gospel transformation to hard to reach places. Mana Church, because of your rock giving, we are able to partner with ministries like Ireland for Jesus, empowering others with a life changing vision. Together, we're building a strong kingdom bridge between the U.S. and Ireland, inviting churches and individuals to join in God's mission. And this is all possible because of your rock giving. Thank you, Mana Church.
Well, good morning, Man of Church. I want to say a great big welcome to each and every one of you, wherever you're joining me right now, whether you're right here in this room with me or wherever you are on the other end of that camera. Maybe you're at one of our multi-sites right here in the Fayetteville Fort Liberty region, perhaps joining us from one of our micro-sites anywhere along the military highway. Maybe you're a man online, maybe you're on the YouTube, or maybe you're my mom watching me. Hi, Mom. I love you. Regardless, can we make them feel welcome? Today I'm going to talk about uh, what the Bible, so we're in 1 Corinthians, and today I'm going to talk about a topic because the Bible's going to take me there, and the topic is biblical sexual ethics. So uh, what I don't want to do is create uh, an awkward conversation for you and your kids on the drive home. So if you think, I, maybe, maybe I, I'm not going to be uh, uncouth, I'm not going to be over the top, I'm not going to say things that you know, are, are deliberately push envelopes, I'm going to teach the Bible. At the same time, if that causes an awkward conversation for you on the drive home, in my introductory time here, I'm not going to feel weird if you, wherever you're watching me, I can't see you wherever you're watching me right now, but if you decide you need to excuse yourself and go to a man of kids, check your kids in there, that's fine. I'm going to teach what the Bible has to say. Sometimes i got to teach that in ways that you know adults need to grab hold of, but at the same time, man of kids, we're going to teach your kids the Bible the way that they need to grab hold of. So, at the same time, uh, if your kids are in middle school, then there's nothing I'm going to say that they won't or likely already haven't heard in school already. So if I help you and help your kids deep, more deeply grasp what the Bible has to say, then you keep them right on in here. So let me make a, let me make a few upfront statements. Upfront statement number one, I am a man of the book and we are a church of the book. I spent a great deal of time in our last series, In the World, Not of the World, talking about that and establishing that as the framework for what I'm going to say. Today, I'm going to teach biblical sexual ethics because if Jesus is your Lord, this is what the Bible teaches you and how the Bible teaches you to live. Now, some of you might be tempted to applaud at moments of this message, and this is not the message for that. I'm teaching what the Bible says, and I'll be honest with you, I like feedback. I'll tell you, what, I'm going to take feedback in just a second, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to give me some feedback, because I'm going to tell you a story about me being a knucklehead. <laughs> You're going to enjoy it. Well, no, hopefully you won't enjoy it. You'll be like, kids, don't, don't do what he did. But here's the thing. I said this last week. We are a church that does not have a morality clause to enter. So what I'm going to teach is the truth of the word, and the truth of the word is too important to be misunderstood by inappropriate emphasis. So the word is clear, so let's let the word be clear. So to start off this morning, I'm going to ask you a question, and this is the feedback portion, so I'm, I'm a, you know, give me, give, me a little, give me a little feedback in this little up front here section. Have you, ever, have you ever done something and then got caught doing that something? Of course, D, yes, of course. All, all, all the while knowing you were incredibly wrong. Yeah, uh, of course. Okay, stories from my, stories from my life. Um, so uh, when I was a kid, we had a Saturday night service here at the Manor Church, and I was scheduled to play keys. Now, this is the year of our Lord, 19 and 99. It's April, and uh, I just graduated high school. I was a homeschooler, so obviously, you know, we started school earlier than the rest of you and graduated earlier than the rest of you. It's really beside the point. But I graduated, and uh, a movie had come out the night that I graduated. I graduated Thursday night, and that's the night The Matrix came out, 1999. So don't, don't judge me. I was 17, all right? Everybody be calm. So my friends and I got tickets and we went to see that movie. I walked out of the theater and I'm gonna be totally honest with you, I, everything had changed. I was like, I can run up walls, I can dodge bullets. Like ev everything about how I conceived, even you know, CG in movies, I was like, the world is a different place. Fast forward two nights, it's Saturday night. We got Saturday night service and your boy is playing keys. The thing is, when you play keys, you also gotta play the altar call. So I finished, I finished with the worship set and um, my friend, you got to be careful how you choose your friends, kids, because if you choose friends with, you know, good company, you know, bad company corrupts good morals. So my friend Jeff Christensen, um, <laughs> we, can't all, we can't all always have been saved, you know what I mean? Anyway, uh, listened to a lot of metal music when he was a kid, very angry. So he, uh, he, he, gets a, he gets a ticket, and he's like, dude, we got tickets to the Matrix. I'm like, what time is it? What time is it showing? They're like, it's the 7 p.m. show. I'm like, oh, service starts at 6.30. Okay, so I'm going to lead worship. And then I'm going to find somebody to cover the altar call, but then I didn't. <laughs> so my dad was preaching, and we got to the altar call portion, and I'm a no-show. And not only am I a no-show, come to find out, 
I was at the theater <laughs> watching The Matrix. I spent the next week in, we didn't have a very big staff then, but I spent the next week in everybody's office, like one at a time. They all called me in, and I knew, boy, I knew it was coming. And I, you know, I knew it was coming, and I knew I was going to get corrected, and I knew that I deserved it. And that is a little bit like, I did, thank you, Jeff. Those of you on the other end of that camera, Jeff Christensen had the audacity to come to church. Well, not the audacity to come to church tonight. Pray for the boy. He's, you know, he's experiencing the love of God in his life and one day might make a decision. Anyway, um, <laughs> that feeling I just described, you are in trouble and you know it. That's kind of what it felt like for the folks in Corinth by the time Paul gets around to writing 1 Corinthians. Paul, who's planted the church in Corinth, has responded He's responded in a lost letter to some questions that they had. So they posed him some questions, not sure how we got to that, but he responds with a letter. And then he sends Timothy, and then on the back of that, he finds out that, you know, the first letter hasn't landed or things haven't gone like they were supposed to, so then he sends this letter, 1 Corinthians. It's not the first correspondence with the Corinthian church, it's just the first one you have recorded in your Bible. And it's kind of on the stern side in some places because in a lot of ways, I feel like I can see in the pages here, he's writing to them like their father, which to be honest, kind of, kind of reminds me of my dad. Uh, I told you last week that my grandmother, a southerner from Georgia, would say things to Chris if I'm not repeating myself. Well, she was my dad's mom. And my dad grabbed hold of that like it was the gospel. And my dad just grew up like, I'm not repeating myself. He'd say it, and I'd be like, what? Well, no. He'd be like, I'm not repeating myself. He just did not. That reminds me of my dad. He did, not, he did not like repeating himself. In a lot of ways, I see that in 1 Corinthians. Paul's like, you're making me say this again? I, had a, I, have, I have a great dad. I have a great father. And I can think of a bunch of places in my life where he was stern. I mean, the more stories I tell you, the more you're like, I can see why he had to be stern. Um, I, I get it. But, you know, he, when he was stern and strong, he was always strong because he wanted what was best for me. He cared about my future. He cared about my success. He cared about my marriage. He cared about my future job. Everything about where he was stern, he was stern with a long view in mind. Whenever he would come to the spot where he had to issue, how should we say, uh, clear correction. So what I want you to do is when I talk about fatherly input, not all of us have a chip for that. So what I want you to do is borrow from my relationship with my dad as you listen to Paul. As you listen to Paul correcting as a father, borrow from my relationship. Don't pick spots where people have yelled at you before. My dad always used to say this, correction is not rejection, it's direction. My dad believed in clear, and I do mean clear, once I'd been through everybody else's office, I got to his office, and I, anyway. <laughs> I was 17. I think he might have threatened to whoop me anyway. But <laughs> you know, correction is not rejection. Correction is direction. My dad, my dad believed that correction is something that needed to be brought clearly, that needed to be brought often, and it needed to be brought in, well, I'll explain. Corinthians is written to uh, the church in Corinth, and I mentioned a little bit of the background of Corinth, but I just I gotta keep I gotta keep reminding you of where we are in world and in history when we talk about the context of this letter. Uh, Cor Corinth was a debauched place. Last week I said that in many ways their society resembled ours, just without the internet. Uh, I got an extra week to study, and I want to change that because I might have understated that just a little bit. In some ways, it was far worse than any of the sin cities that we even have today. I mean, even in our sin cities, you can think of sin cities around the world, that sort of behavior I'm talking about is even still uh, illegal, even though it's uh, engaged in. Well, here in Corinth, it's not even illegal. It's celebrated. There was rampant sexual license and false worship. And what's even more disturbing is the both of those that went together. I mean, it was a, it was a wild place. And we have this from extra biblical records Corinth was a destination for wild. I mean, it was known as you went, you went there to get Corinthianized. I mean, it's, it's what people would say in the ancient world. It's so wild that Paul, who's already weary from a not-so-great second missionary journey, that's what he's in when he comes to Corinth. He arrives in Corinth from Athens. Now, he's a bit fearful. I'm going to show you a spot where he actually says that about himself. He's, he's actually, I think, kind of dreading this. I mean, 
He was alarmed by what he'd experienced in Athens, but he doesn't feel a great deal better when he arrives in Corinth. He's looking for friends. He's worn out. I mean, I, I don't know about you. Do you ever feel like, you know, you're just worn out? Do you ever feel like things are just kind of raging all around you and you're just, I don't know, a little bit weary? I, saying to yourself things like, I, I don't particularly want to talk about this again, or I, I don't want to have to go through this again. Paul describes how he's feeling in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Paul shows up. Uh, Paul shows up, you know, a little down and out. The journey hasn't gone well. He said it once. They didn't listen. He's got to say it again. I got to imagine what that feels like to have to keep repeating yourself and keep going in after the same things. He, he's, he's not gone well. He's starting to second guess what's going on, but he, he, makes, he makes very deep covenant friends in this city. Their, their relationship revitalizes what's going to be the next phase of his ministry. And so it's into this environment and, and into this environment of just debauchery at the same time from a place of a little bit of weariness that Paul plants a church. And he teaches them a new way to live. He teaches them a new way to live that's built on the person of this Jesus fellow, this crucified Jewish Messiah who's alive, who resides in heavenly places, is on the throne and has established a kingdom. It's a new and yet very old idea. Paul doesn't erase any of the old covenant of who he is as a Jew. He just builds onto this what happened in Jesus coming next and establishing this kingdom that was the fulfillment of the promise all along. He teaches the church in Corinth some new ways. But you know, you know how new ways and new habits, if you're not careful and you don't establish them and root them in your life, they just sort of revert back to your old habits. It's like in January when we all make the New Year's resolutions and then, you know, two weeks later you can park front and center at the gym again. <laughs> It's just kind of what happens. It, it's, it's one of the things that I adore. I adore a lot of things about this, this letter, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians together, the Corinthian exchange. One of the things that I adore is the humanity of this letter. I don't celebrate that the Corinthian church has to be reminded of the basics, but here's what, here's what this dialogue and the spirit of this dialogue, they help me find me in the story because it's a very human thing that they're experiencing. They'd, they'd fallen back into some of their old ways. So Paul wrote, and Paul wrote gently but with clarity. I like to think of Dr. Tim Elmore's book, Habitudes. He talks about a velvet-covered brick. It's kind of how Paul's behaving. The idea of that is this. Whatever statement you're making is couched in as much kindness and grace as the truth allows. I'll say it again a little bit slower. Whatever statement that you're making is couched, is delivered with as much grace and as, as softly as the truth, kindness as the truth allows, soft to the touch yet full of grace, but at the same time unyielding and full of truth. I told you last week a statement around the man of church offices is we want to be people who are candid but who have candor with kindness. Today we're going to talk about a topic that was vital for them and is of equally crucial importance for where we live today, and that is the topic of biblical sexual ethics. Now, here's the thing about Paul. Paul, just like Jesus, if you'd gone up to Paul and said, well, now that Jesus has come and you're writing this New Testament that's going to be released here sometime soon, it means we can take the Old Testament, tear it up, and throw it away. He would have laughed in your face. Because long before Paul was even around, long before Paul wrote a letter, millennia before he was even born, he had memorized, like Paul's the super Jew. Paul's the Jew amongst Jews, trained by Gamaliel. Paul has this stuff memorized. One of the first things that Paul's going to memorize are the first chapters in Genesis. And in that, we find God establishing his standard for human ethics. I'm going to turn to the most quoted verse in the Bible by the Bible. That, that's going to tell you quite how important this is. You're going to find this phrase repeated throughout Scripture. It's going to be one of the earliest texts written to some of the final ones that are actually recorded. And incidentally, this passage of Scripture, Genesis 1 and 2, is one that I one that I preached for a few weeks with my wife in the beginning of the year called The Plan. You can find that on the app or the website or the YouTube. I went into a, a significant, significantly more detail. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to start in verse 20 and read to verse 25. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, 
took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to the man. The man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. God's design was to create two unique genders to complement each other, man and woman, image bearers of the creator, created to be in relationship with each other. And this design includes sex as a gift for pleasure and procreation. Verse 24, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is that, this is that oft-quoted verse, the most quoted verse by the Bible in the Bible. This is, uh, for, all, for all intents and purposes, this is God's design for human sexual expression. One biological man he has created, one biological woman within the covenant of marriage, ideally for life. Now, we're going to talk about divorce a little bit later on, what happens w- within that. The framework, however, is important. It's important to establish the framework, the theology, before we deal with nuance. One man, one woman in marriage for life sets the standard for human sexual ethics. Well, you said something a second ago, Chris. You said theology before nuance. Yes, theology before nuance. Now, is nuance a part of the equation? Well, clearly it has to be. Why? Because God created you unique, which means he's a pretty smart guy, you know? I I believe he always intended and planned with nuance in mind, but after principle, principle before nuance. So what does this mean in application? This means in application that 100% of your sexual energy should be devoted to your spouse. Therefore, prior to marriage, it is saved for your spouse in marriage. In marriage, it is devoted to your spouse and no one else. Should that marriage end, it's not expressed until one enters the covenant of marriage again, according to God's principles. And then the verse that most often people stop reading before, verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I don't know why we don't read that. That's, that's, one, <laughs> that's kind of a fun one to me. <laughs> Sex was created without shame. I said this to you last week. The thing about sin that is so damaging is that sin, and sin, that, that was the end of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 3, sin enters the equation. The, the, the problem with sin in the fall is that sin, sin brings shame and a warping of things. Sin, sin warps and it, 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 it brings shame and it brings guilt and it brings, it brings condemnation. It brings all things that we were not designed in the beginning to even carry. That was the whole thing with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This was for God, not for us. But see, the thing is, in the confines of God's plan, sex continues to be a gift without shame and without disgrace. So this sexual ethic that I just told you is repeated throughout the Bible. Now, Dr. Preston Sprinkle of the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender, who also lectures at Nottingham University, said something, I heard him say something on a podcast, a little something like this. There are, no serious Bible scholar is actually going to give credence to the idea that the Bible teaches anything other than this stance. The scholarship is overwhelming on this point. God is really clear. So, allow me to be clear as well. Every sexual expression outside of God's design is sinful. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some things that ran into my mind. This means sex before marriage, even by a committed, engaged couple. This means things like sex with self. This means porn. This means lustful images. This means erotic literature. This means LGBTQ+. Outside of God's design, here's, here's, here's the root problem of all the rest of these things that have tried to jump on this, can I say sex bandwagon? I don't, that sounds weird when I say it, but there's there's so many things that have tried to ride on, that try to ride on God's design. What we've got is outside of God's design, society has attempted to make sexual drive a need to be satisfied or an appetite to be fed versus God's design, which is this, a gift to be enjoyed. I mean, listen to me, even how I'm stating that, Sex is not a hill to be conquered. It's a gift to be safeguarded and curated. That word curated 
deserves a little weight. If you go to a really nice, fancy restaurant, you might bump into somebody called a sommelier, someone whose craft and art is to take wine and pair it with really good food because the two of these things together just create a heightening of, of the enjoyment of the meal that you're eating. When you think about all the work and the care that goes into curating a list of things and pairings and this and that, it's the same idea with the sexual expression that God has created a husband and a wife to live in. It's something to be safeguarded. It's something to be, to be curated. So Paul applies this same ethic. And this same ethic he got, and I, I told you this on purpose, because he's, he's the super Jew. What does that mean? He, he's memorized the Torah. He knows all first five of the books of the Bible by memory. So he takes this sexual ethic that he's now memorized and been steeped in from the time he was a boy, and he applies it to the casual sex that the Corinthians are engaging in with the cult prostitutes. And in this section of the letter, we're going to see some of the why behind God's sexual ethics. So if you have your Bible, I'm in the first letter uh, that you have in your Bible to the Corinthians. I always used to call it the first letter to the Corinthians. Then I started preaching this series. I'm like, I should probably stop calling it that because it's not. But anyway. I'm in verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. These are in quotations because Paul is speaking on behalf of the Corinthians, whether this is what they've actually been saying or whether he's putting the words in their mouth. Regardless, he's addressing how the the information's filtering back to him. Verse 13, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Incidentally, That whole notion I just rattled off to you a second ago about thinking about sexual appetite as a drive just like food is a drive, well, that's this is where I get that. This is the argument that the Corinthians are using. It's their justification for why they're engaging in the way that they're engaging. Well, you know, I'm a human, so what does a human do? Well, a human, this is what they're saying. A human, when they're hungry, goes to Taco Bell for fourth meal and gets a chicken quesadilla in the middle of the night. I mean, it's just what a human does, you know? Just like that, we Corinthians, we're sexual beings. So what does that mean? Well, we satisfy ourselves. Paul keeps going. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. This is, this is why this area of our lives is so important, because we have a responsibility to Jesus. I talk about that life trade thing all the time. I talk about the idea that this is not something that fits kind of neatly into a little box of my life, but what Jesus is offering is all of him for all of me. Now, I also have to point this out right here. Paul is not writing to the city of Corinth. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. I said this last week, I want to restate it. I expect the lost to act lost. I expect those outside of the covenant to behave as if they are outside of the covenant, particularly in this area. But for those of us who trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he's the one who gets to decide what we believe, how we live, what we devote ourselves to, the impulses that we follow, when I, when I place my trust in Jesus, I step over the line into the kingdom, I become a citizen of the kingdom, I become bought with his blood, purchased with the price of his life, all of a sudden my spirit is alive, I become regenerated, the Holy Spirit fills me and prepares me for an eternity with my Father in heaven, and what that means is I can no longer look at life the way that I used to. It means that his word and his ways dictate my worldview, verse 14. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. I told you, it's it's always creeping in the back of Paul's mind. Jesus, the crucified Messiah, got back up and is alive, which means that everything he purchased on that cross is not just available in the life to come. It's also available in the present. You You see this popping up every time Paul's writing. Look for it. Verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? He's getting into the identity space here because he's talking about the trade that has happened. Don't you know that your bodies are members of the body of Christ? What does that mean? You've taken off the old self. You've put on a new self. You're grafted into a new, you're grafted into a new family, into a new kingdom. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make the members of a prostitute? Never. This that Paul's starting to creep into now is the identity space. That's what he's talking about in verse 15. In a second, he's going to make the statement that Jesus bought you for a price the price of his blood. This is an all-life trade, all of him for all of you. So sin doesn't work. A, because sin is bad for you and warps things. B, because sin violates God. It's not not just a mistake. 
It's not just a bad idea. It is an affront to our Creator, to our Savior, and violates the originality of the design that the Holy Spirit is reverse engineering, if, if you will, in your life. That's the process of sanctification. The process of sanctification is taking all of the sin, re- remove, make, conforming you to become more like Jesus as you're prepared for an eternity with him. Verse 16, or do you not know that he was joined to a prostitute becomes one in body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. So here, Paul grabs hold of something he's known for as long as he's been in rabbi school, which is likely from the time he was a, he was a young boy. I mean, he's probably 12 or 13 by the time he enters into the rabbinical training. So by the time he's here now, this is somewhere in the 50s probably, by the time he's here where he is now, I mean, we're talking, this dude is significantly older. He repeats this passage from Genesis. This is, this is the amazing thing about God. God created us. God shaped you. God God, different than, any, different than any other thing, different than any other thing he created, he spoke the earth into existence, and with humanity he used his hands and he breathed his spirit into their nostrils. He created you, he shaped you, and that means he knows the user manual because he wrote the user manual. That, that, is, that is a space that is uniquely his. Who gets to decide? That's what this whole struggle of the world system is about. The world system says that you can sit on the throne and you can decide, and the Bible says, no, you can't, only God can The thing about sexual satisfaction is it releases hormones that literally bond us. Neurochemical, physical bonds to the object of our desire as we experience satisfaction. That could be another physical person, an image. Just like sex is not an appetite to be sated, it's not a spiritual joining of one flesh. It's an actual joining of our body and our soul. And here's the thing. God has your best in mind. God has, God has what's best for you. He wants you to have a life full of joy. He wants you to have a life full of satisfaction, no shame, wonderful, amazing things as it relates to sex, but only possible if we follow his design. Shortcuts, shortcuts might be fun for a minute, but in the end, they'll break you, they'll corrupt you, they'll take you down a rabbit hole and trap you in ways that you are in all likelihood unprepared for. I, I don't say that as somebody that's read about studies and statistics in a book. This is, this is what I've done. You can stop members of our team and our staff and ask how... Th- th- mm. I won't go down the rabbit hole either, but this is not something that you play with. If I, if I, had, if I had unlimited amounts of time, I, I would just begin to break down how sexual sin is destroying individuals and society. It's appalling. And, and not... not and, I could, I could do that for a while just from a neurochemical or scientific point of view. I mean, I, I could do that just talking about research that is non-Christian even. I recently read an article from a professed atheist, a study from a professed atheist NYU professor talking about the damaging effects of this thing. And, and while I'm here, while I'm here, I cannot talk about biblical sexual ethics without talking about the other purpose of sex. I've talked about the pleasure side for a second. The other purpose of sex, which is life. God gave human sex in order to create life. Sex creates life. We don't hold the authority to end life. It says in Psalm 139, verse 13, for you knit me together in my mother's womb. You formed my inward parts. I flipped those. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Before you were even a thought or a twinkle in someone's eye, he had every step planned and purposed for you. He holds you squarely in the palm of his hand, which means he is the author of life and the one who chooses when life ends. Therefore, therefore, the continuation of God's sexual ethics and application is this. Abortion is sin in the eyes of God. I recognize, I recognize that many people have been affected. Many people have been affected by this. And I will never make that statement without saying that God is gracious and he forgives and he heals and he has restoration and wholeness and he brings. Listen to me. When he hung up on that cross and he looked through the quarters of time and said, it is finished, he said, Father, forgive them before he'd even done the act. Forgiveness was tumbling from him before they'd even finished the act of crucifying him. He went to the cross to bring healing, to heal our hurts, to heal our wounds, to heal our sin, to heal our shame. But the text demands that I'm crystal clear on this point. Verse 17. 
But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one in spirit with him. Sex and marriage is a wonderful thing. I'm going to talk about that next week. Partially, partially because that complete intimacy was always designed as a picture of the depth of the intimacy we were designed to have with, the, have with our Lord. What do you mean, Chris? Totally seen, totally known, totally loved, with nothing held back. So, I said this in the, I forget when I said this. I'm getting old. I know where I am sometimes. I said, no, I remember what it was. It was in the world, not of the world. I said, you know, some of you might be thinking, Chris, what, what, what's, the, what's the agenda? Like, bottom line, be bluff. Bottom line up front. Like, lay, g- give it to me. What's, what's going on here? It, the purpose of what I'm talking about is not to laden you with a bunch of old archaic rules from a dusty old book. No, no, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Let's live in a place of freedom because this is what he has for you. Unrestrained joy in his perfect plan. The thing is, I sometimes wonder if we have the definition of freedom completely wrong. Freedom's not the absence of laws or regulations or borders. Freedom is the ability to operate inside of clear prescription. Freedom is the ability. Freedom is not the license. It is the ability to be totally free in God's design. I'm going to get real practical with you for a second because the Bible is. Verse 18, flee from sexual immorality, which means what? Run away! You ever seen the movie Monty Python? Brave Sir Robin ran away, he ran away, he ran away. Get the heck out of there. Go, run. This is the answer you're going to see throughout Scripture. How do I deal with sexual sin? You don't fight it. You don't try to overcome it. You don't try to white knuckle through it. You don't try to self-control your way through it. You run the cuss away. You flee. Drop your gun and take off. Which helps anyway because purity is not a line. Purity is a direction. Run the other way and get some help. You, you, don't, you don't achieve. Listen, the first step, I'll preach this next year in January. The first step in seven steps to freedom, the first step is admitting you have a problem. Call your sin, sin, and admit you're trapped in it. The second, find somebody. You're not going to get sexually free alone. Flee, run away with those who are running a little bit faster than you. My family and I actually use technology to help. We use programs like Accountable to You and a service that we watch movies through called VidAngel. This is an old Chris Fletcherism, but don't be one click away from anything. I want to be a click, a button push, a decision, plus artificial intelligence that wraps it all up very neatly and emails my wife. It's helpful. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Paul takes this even deeper. All sins are wrong. Some sins come with deeper consequences. And sexual sin comes with grievous consequences, and it isn't just you. It's other people who are around you. This impacts you. This impacts your spouse. This impacts your future spouse. This impacts your children. This impacts your connection to God. One of the most damaging things about sexual sin is it builds a wall of isolation around your life where the shame and the, and the ickiness that you feel makes you feel like you're not worthy to walk into the presence of God and receive forgiveness. And so all of a sudden, you find distance and isolation, and you're like, where are you, God? Why won't you? It's because we've allowed the sin and the shame and the guilt and the walls and the bricks to all gather all around us. On the other side, what would happen in society? If we practiced God's sexual ethic, what would be eliminated? If we practiced God's sexual ethic, what would be eliminated? Pornography as we know it. Sexual abuse. The human sexual slave trade. This one, this one wouldn't be eliminated because I'm not prepared to say that this issue is only down to sexual sin but it would eliminate some of it. Fatherless homes. Boys, it's, it's time to be men. When I said to flee, that doesn't mean to flee from your family. Verse 19. Or do you know, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. But man, Chris, this is a a heavy message. I know it is. 
because sex, sex, sexual sin comes with oversized shame. It comes with oversized shame and traps like almost no other sin. And the thing is, in our society, the damage radius affects almost everybody. I mean, if I, if I didn't already feel this passionately about this because what I want for you is freedom, if, if that wasn't already motivation enough, it is motivating enough based on the fact that there are children being raised in today's world. I have some very dear friends who teach school, and when we talk about some of the things that happen, listen, you know, we send our kids to school so they can learn, so they can get a good job, so they can be prepared for the future, so they can not make the same mistakes that were made. I mean, we, we, we educate them so that they can take a flying leap into the future, ready to take on the world and be amazing citizens and people of God and fathers and mothers. That's why we send them to school, right? Oh, okay. Uh, I take some feedback there. We send them to school for that reason. The, 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 thing, the thing is, man, the blast radius, the blast radius of deviant sexual, of nothing else, the sharing of pornography in school is enough for us to go, you know what? I'm going to draw a line in the sand in my own life and say this stops here with me. Why? Because we're going to be the people who model freedom for others. We're going to walk in freedom and invite others into freedom because at least, if nothing else, the blast radius on kids is not worth it. Sexual sin stings and warps and brings shame, and yet, the greatest news of all, Romans chapter 5 says, while we were yet sinners. You know the thing in my faith I can never get the other side of? It's communion. Outlined in Corinthians. It's communion, and I'll tell you why. Because I know me. I know everything about me. I know who I was. And I can never reconcile that Jesus, perfect expression of love and, and sinless perfection, would hang on that cross and offer himself for me. What kind of trade is this? In that moment, Jesus was willing to pay the ultimate price for the joy set before him, which was you. You were bought with a price. You are so valuable to God. He bought you so that you would leave aside the sin that so easily entangles. I've said this already once. He did not purchase you to make your life more miserable and difficult. He purchased you to set you free. You know, he created us in a garden to do what? to enjoy unbroken connection with him forever. That's why he came after the fall to set things right, to what? Reverse engineer that which we broke. He came to set you free, not just, not just in the life to come, but now, today. He bought you to be free. He bought you for joy. He bought you for mercy. He bought you for peace. Freedom is possible, and you don't earn it through your own effort. You don't access it by trying harder. You don't access it by going, oh, I know that I'm wrong. I should just do better. I'll just do better. No, you access it through the cross, through the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to help you right now. If you want to get free from sin, don't work your way out. Get more Jesus. Jesus in your life, the book in your life, the Holy Spirit in your life crowds out sin. We say it this way, devotion to Christ is the place where the human heart is most satisfied and where you are at your freest fill up on the grace of God. Worship your way to freedom with others. Confession to God leads to forgiveness. Confession to others leads to healing. You know why confession to others leads to healing? Because you take the keys, the triggers, the things that cause you to fall off the way and you give them to somebody else. Now someone's asking you questions and checking up on you. Manor Church is the greatest church on the planet, and I'll tell you why. I have walked into freedom as a result of people right out here who loved me, prayed for me, and decided to be that for me, accountability in my life. And now I walk in freedom. Why? Because you're a great guy. No, because God is good and on the throne and because people around here love me. Let's be the people who step into freedom together. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we're grateful for your work on the cross. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Bow your heads and close your eyes, and I mean all of you. You guys in the back, I'm talking to you. Stand over there, bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm gonna do the same thing. For some of us right now, wherever you're watching, any of our sites, wherever you're watching right now, some of you need to take an action step right now and tell yourself and tell the Lord that you have a problem. So if that's you with every head bowed, every eye closed, and I mean all of them, I'm not looking. I'm not gonna ask you to do anything else. If that's you, raise your hand and hold it up and then put it right back down. Acknowledge, admit to yourself that you are trapped in sin and cannot find your way out. 
Jesus, we're so grateful for your power and your grace. Lord, you, you see the result, I don't. Come your kingdom, be done your will in our lives. In Jesus' name, keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer. Maybe, maybe for you, the issue is you're not walking in a relationship with Jesus. You've tried to, be, you've tried to do better. You're trying to, trying to fix yourself. You're trying to improve, but it's not the way to change. All have sinned and fallen short of the, of the glory of God. Jesus came to set right our broken relationship with Jesus. So if you're not walking in a relationship with Jesus, maybe you prayed a prayer one time, but you know you haven't asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, or you're not walking in a relationship with him. Wherever you're watching me right now, or right here in this room, would you raise your hand? In a second, we're all gonna pray a prayer out loud together. I promise you I'm not gonna embarrass you. If that's you, raise your hand and hold it up long enough for me or one of our team members to see it. Yep, I see your hand. Raise your hand. Yep, I see your hand. Yep, I see your hand. Raise your hand. Hold it up long enough for me or one of our team members to see it. They're going to put a packet in your hand. The packet says, I raised my hand. You're not joining anything. We're not putting you on a spam list. We want to send you. But fill that card out and leave it on your seat. You're not, you're not joining anything. You're not on some spam list. We want to give you some resources to help you take your next steps in your journey with Jesus. If we haven't seen you, look at the seat back pocket. In front of you, that same card is there. Fill it out. Leave it on your seat. Anybody else want to jump in with these who've made this, who, who've raised their hands? Raise your hand, hold it up long enough for me and one of our team members to see it right now. All right, come on, church, repeat this after me from the bottom of our hearts like it's our first time. Say, Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Please come into my heart. Please forgive my sin. Please be the Lord of my life. And I'll follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. We put our hands together and celebrate with those who made that decision today.